it didn't matter if it was a, an exotic chicken or a gorilla that we were working on, people wanted to see it and they stayed for the entire procedure. And what they came away with was a deep understanding of not only maybe that specific animal and that specific condition, but also better understanding of how people want to really help animals in that human-animal bond. Welcome to Spur of the Moment, the podcast of Colorado State University's Spur Campus in Denver, Colorado. You know, I'm sad to report that the veterinary profession, I think, is... Um, the whitest profession out there. And we have a lot of work to do. And I find anytime you can combine fun and learning, it's it's obviously a much more productive and memorable way. And people want to spend a lot more time in that space than they do, you know, having somebody lecture in front of a chalkboard. On this podcast, we talk with experts in food, water, and health about how they are tackling big challenges that we face in these three areas. I'm Jocelyn Hiddle, and on this episode, I was joined by Dr. Mark Stetter, who was at the time the Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at CSU. Dr. Stetter is a board-certified zoological veterinarian and an international leader in wildlife research and conservation. Dr. Stetter came to CSU in 2012 from the Walt Disney Company, where he was Director of Animal Operations. And Dr. Stetter has his veterinary degree and undergraduate degree from the University of Illinois. Welcome, Dr. Stetter. Well, hello, Jocelyn. Thanks for inviting me. Happy to have you. So we're going to dive right in and and find out a little bit more about the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Can you tell us about the college? Absolutely. So it's a great place. We're located up here in Fort Collins. We're one of eight colleges at Colorado State University and have been around for over 100 years. So lots of history and lots of wonderful things that we've accomplished through those 100 plus years. Probably known most for our Doctor of Veterinary Medicine program. So we graduate about 150 veterinary students every year. Um, It's a very intensive program, very similar to medical school. So they spend four years with us um, learning about all the different types of critters from dogs and cats to chickens and pigs and horses, um, and then how to do all the different medical and surgical work with them. So that could include routine exams or listening to the heart or having to do the surgery, or if it's a horse or a cow, a variety of different types of hoof work and, and huge variety of things. So it's a great program. We're typically listed as one of the top programs in the world um, and have many, many thousands of students that try to come here and um, gain entrance. Now, in addition to the veterinary program, um, we do a lot of work also in human health. So the second part of our name, College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, the biomedical sciences is is a great deal of human health um, research and teaching that, that we do. So we have about 700 undergraduate students that are getting degrees in biomedical sciences. Think about anatomy and physiology and infectious disease and things of that sort. Um, And then we have a lot of uh, people that are doing research and things like neuroscience or reproduction and and, um, microbiology. So it's a great place to to learn and it's a great place to provide a lot of um, services to society that we all need, especially in a time like this, there's a worldwide pandemic that's facing us. Absolutely. I think one of the things that the college is known for is innovation around these areas of health. And there are a couple of different avenues I'd like to follow there, but why don't we start a little bit with some of the innovations around how you teach, since you mentioned your your teaching programs first. What are some of the ways that CVMBS, which is how we, the shorthand huh, for those of us within the college refer to it, how are you teaching students, both undergrad and graduate students in innovative and unique ways? So there's two main trends that we're really on the cutting edge. Number one would be hands-on learning. And so at least for folks like me, it really helps reinforce what you might read or, or listen to if you're able to do it. And when I say do it, if it's, for example, maybe in microbiology, um, your laboratory includes going out and collecting samples from the world around us and determining what germs live in your shoes and what lives in your mouth and what lives on the couch at home and being able to do those kind of hands-on experiments and bring them to the lab and learn from your faculty and help teach you those kind of things. And in the veterinary world, obviously hands-on means how do you learn how to put a halter on a horse and how to listen to a cow and how to um, fix a broken leg with different critters. So we do a lot of the hands-on to augment Uh, the more traditional learning in in books and and in lectures. Um, But we also use technology in lots of exciting and innovative ways. And um, one of them is using virtual reality. So as you know, Jocelyn, we've been able to take 
what has historically been kind of a, a fairly book centric course like anatomy and turn it into the virtual world. So we can take you now through the human body or through the animal body in the virtual space. And we have um, whole laboratories where a hundred students can put on VR goggles and literally travel through the human brain or heart. And then we also are able to use that to connect um, people from around the world. So we have people um, that are at high schools across Colorado that can look at the same thing that our um, professors do here and um, walk you through the different parts of the animal body or human body. And I'm excited that this is part of what we're implementing down at the Spur campus and being able to take school groups and families um, and learn more about how the body works, animals and people, and um, be able to show them in a really engaging, interactive way in the virtual reality space. And, and, and I find anytime you can combine fun and learning, it's, it's obviously a much more productive and memorable way. And people want to spend a lot more time in that space than they do, you know, having somebody lecture in front of a chalkboard. Absolutely. I can't say strongly enough how exciting the VR learning experience is, you know, putting the goggles on and being able to see sort of floating in front of you animals, even molecular structures of of molecules, right? Things that really make so much more sense in 3D um, and in front of you and you can move them around with the, the handsets that you have. It is a really incredible experience. And um, I am jealous of all of the people who are trying to learn organic chemistry or anatomy in that format as compared to the way I had to do it. <laughs> Understood. Let's talk a little bit about another way you all are, are innovative and you, you've you hit on this already, which is the concept of One Health. So can you tell us a little bit about what that term means, why it's important and why it's been a focus for the college? So One Health is this concept that we really need to pull in all the different areas of health um, and better understand how they overlap and work together in a collaborative way. So let me give you a couple examples. You know, typically, if we think about human health and going to medical school, or if we think about veterinary medicine um, and animal health, or if we think about the ecosystem and ecology, um, when we teach those subjects or when we have research grants or when we think about those, they're often isolated in different pockets, and, and we don't often think about how they interact with each other. I, I think COVID-19 and the pandemic has really helped us understand that all these things are interconnected, right? So... The disease came from animals um, and the disease came from probably animals that were in wildlife. And so what are some of the things that we need to better understand to prevent the next pandemic, to understand how diseases go from, people's to, from people to animal and animal to peoples? What are the things that we're doing to disrupt the natural environment that caused these diseases to come out? Ebola is another great example. It's probably been around for you know 100 years. Um, but the only reason that now it's becoming a big problem with people is because we're going into places in the jungle that we didn't before. There's now roads and logging that take you there and that people now can leave the jungle and go into a community or travel on a plane and now potentially cause a worldwide epidemic. So understanding how human health, animal health and the ecosystem are all very much connected um, is what One Health is all about. And, and CSU, I'm proud to say, has developed the One Health Institute that really is bringing together faculty and students to think about these things more holistically. And it's become a whole new area of study. So a variety of medical schools and veterinary schools and, and universities across the nation have embraced this idea. And it's something that I think a lot of students and the public are going to be interested in more and more about. Speaking of the public being more interested in, in these subjects, I think there's no better time than right now to think about One Health and to talk about One Health in terms of the general public's understanding of this concept. It's been so front and center with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, over the last year. Can you talk a little bit about how you've seen the public understanding of One Health expand over the last year or so? And then also we can maybe use that as an opportunity to, to say, how has the college also engaged around COVID-19 specifically? I know there've been a lot of research projects that have, have been not only seeking to understand the pandemic, but also seeking to be helpful in fighting it. Absolutely. So let me give you a couple other examples when we think about One Health that people may not be aware of. One would be what I guess we often call translational medicine or the overlap between um, animal health and human health. So cancer is a great example of how we're learning a tremendous amount of things from animals that have developed cancer in a natural model 
and how it can help people. So our Animal Cancer Center here has about 30 different clinical trials where we're trying new drugs, new chemotherapies, new ways to treat cancer that are experimental, learning about these things from animals who develop the same diseases and how that can help um, influence how we help people is a big part of One Health. I'll, I'll give you another example. And that's about um, you know, the tragedy that's been happening across the country with homeless populations. Um, and we know that in many situations, uh, homeless populations may not have access to their own medical care. So they might need um, more traditional care as far as a physician, but they also might need social workers and they also might need counseling in different ways. Um, and we often find that this, this group of people may not want to go to a hospital, but many of them, as you know, have pets and we'll, we'll see that they're very invested and care very deeply about um, the welfare of their animals. And what we've seen here, both in clinics in Fort Collins, clinics in Denver, and then across the nation, is that if we can provide no cost veterinary care to the pets of the homeless, that often the homeless will come in and help take care of themselves also. And so it's a great way when we think about One Health or combining animal health and human health and facilities and society needs, you can start to see how we can build, bring together um, physicians, veterinarians, students, and um, these different populations that need access to veterinary care, need access to human health care, need access to others, um, other things that they wouldn't do without using the veterinary medicine piece to kind of as a hook to bring them in. So that's just one other aspect from how we're kind of combining animal health and human health in, in new and innovative ways. Thanks so much for those additional examples. I think what you just described is some additional great examples of also how we provide care in a more comprehensive way, not just understanding the system better, the human animal environmental health connection, but also how do we proactively provide care that's more focused on all three of those things at once. Speaking of providing care and also that translational medicine piece, can you talk a little bit about the collaboration that CSU has started with UC Health? We're really excited to have a new branch campus of the medical school. So the Anschutz campus, as you know, is in Denver, a phenomenal facility for teaching medical students. Um, and we've worked with the Anschutz campus for years um, in some of these areas, like I just mentioned, with cancer and, and translational medicine and research. Um, and probably about six years ago, um, the leadership from the medical school and CSU got together and said, hey, we should do some more things together and really helping, whether you call it under this One Health banner or just collaborating more deeply. And we decided to open a branch campus for medical students here at CSU. So this year, this just last month, um, we started with our first four-year cohort of medical students that will be here in Fort Collins for the entire four years that are part of CSU and part of the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, but as a branch campus to the mothership, to the main main campus in um, at the entrance campus in, in the CU School of Medicine. So they'll have the same curriculum um, that the students have down at the entrance campus, but they'll have faculty um, and facilities and exposure to everything um, here in Fort Collins. And it's been great. Um, I, I met with those 12 students um, just a couple of weeks ago. They're excited to be here in Fort Collins. They're excited to understand how they can better interface with, with the veterinary component and also the research components. So, you know, on their first morning, the first day, they were um, wanting to know, how do I spend time over in the veterinary emergency care unit? I want to learn more about this, or I'm interested in neuroscience, and I want to know if I can work with certain researchers. So I think it's going to be a really exciting time for us to grow that cohort. So we're starting with 12 students. In a couple of years, we'll go up to 24 for each class, and then eventually we'll have the ability to the building we created um, to have 200 medical students at any one time. So I know the folks at the Anschutz campus are excited about this collaboration and we are too. Yes, I would say that it's one of the hallmarks of the college and CSU in general, The this collaborative spirit, right? We're interested in figuring out how we can do more together with other partners, including other universities. That's a great example of that. So you've talked about the college's education, and obviously the College of Vet Med and Biomedical Sciences has been a top-rated vet school for a long time. Can you tell us a little bit about the research side? And maybe you can hit on a couple of things related to COVID um, if you'd like, or really maybe there are some things that over the past year have been a particular focus. Certainly. So let me give you just kind of a brief rundown on um, some of the human health research that we do, and then we'll we'll finish up with, with COVID. But 
Um, we have a big neuroscience team um, and they are studying everything from um, addiction, obesity, Parkinson's disease, and other neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and such. Um, and they're really a phenomenal group that um, have become world renowned in, in what they do and receive a tremendous amount of um, NIH and other uh, funding in that space. We also do a lot of work in reproductive physiology. Um, and so when I say that, um, both in animals and in people, but how do we help um, if somebody wants to become pregnant and are infertile, there are a variety of um, hormonal and other assisted reproductive techniques that we've actually developed through the years. And we've uh, often used animals as the model and then be able to help um, help people. And then we also do a tremendous amount of work in um, microbiology or infectious disease. And, and to your point, COVID has been the big focus over a year and a half now. So whether it be, what are the best disinfectants for these types of viruses? What are the best ways to develop a vaccine for these? The other research we've been doing are, do animals get this? And we're learning, um, yes, certain animals can get it. In rare cases, they really don't give it to people, which is great news. But if we were worried about that, are there vaccines that we can develop that are specific for animals? And so we've been working on vaccines, for example, for cats and determining if they need, um, need that kind of work. And then a huge amount of work to better understand how does this get transmitted? Um, what are the aerosolization um, methods? And we know a lot more now than we did a couple of years ago when this was first happening, but we have people that are looking at mask quality, how far can droplets spread? Um, what are ways we can mitigate uh, spread? And what are some of the drugs that we can use to help um, treat or prevent COVID? So um, uh, our microbiology, immunology and pathology department, which is over hundred faculty um, have really pivoted from any other work that they were doing in the last, um, you know, may have been decades, they've been working on HIV or bacterial diseases. And now they've said, hey, we need to help uh, fight this worldwide pandemic. Continuing on the theme of collaboration that in some cases, your researchers are also working with faculty out of the College of Engineering or uh, Health and Human Sciences, because it really needed to be a, an all hands on deck approach. And all of this sort of systems thinking around one health and around COVID, I think what you all have done in terms of collaborating within the college and, and with other institutions is, you know, the hallmark of how best to attack these problems. Correct, Jocelyn. And, you know, we are also lucky to have a lot of the national headquarters here in Fort Collins. So the CDC has their Western regional headquarters, the USDA, um, a lot of these government agencies that we work with um, heavily with research, um, being able to collaborate with them right in town has been very helpful. Great. Yeah, thanks. So now is the time for the sad question. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> you're leaving CSU, which all of us who've had the pleasure of working with you for a number of years are really sad about. Obviously, you have a wonderful new opportunity at UC Davis, and we're really happy for you about that. But of course, we're sad to see you go. So maybe we can just take a moment and have you reflect back over your tenure at CSU and, and uh, tell us a little bit about what you're most proud of. I've been here coming up on 10 years, and it's been a great ride. So we've done just some phenomenal things. And as you know, a lot of them have been down in Denver. I'm really excited to come back and see um, VITA, the new animal health complex open at SPUR, uh, what's gonna happen there for um, the city of Denver, what's gonna happen for just the general public that wanna come visit and learn more about health um, and what's gonna happen with our students and helping animals is gonna be phenomenal. So, um, so I'm really excited to see that blossom and after our years of figuring out how to get the money, get the collaborations and, and make a big difference. Um, I think it's going to make a huge difference. And I'm, I'm excited about that. Here on campus, we talked a little bit about the med school collaboration already, but we've also been able to really grow um, a lot of our teaching and, and um, research and service facilities. So we kind of joked that over the last nine years, we've opened nine buildings. And so we've been on a tremendous growth spurt. And some of them are the virtual reality that we talked about, some of them are new hospital facilities and how we take care of our animals. Um, and some of them are new um, research laboratories in areas that we can find out new ways to stop the next pandemic. So it's been, it's been really wonderful. And I, as you mentioned during the introduction, came from Walt Disney World, which is kind of a, an interesting career path. I was unsure how the ivory towers and how academia would welcome a Mickey Mouse veterinarian from Walt Disney World. And I think it's safe to say that everybody has been extremely um, open and welcoming and excited to have 
somebody um, new come in and, and bring some new ideas and see what we could do together. So, so all that's been a great ride. And as you know, Colorado is a phenomenal place to live. Fort Collins is a um, beautiful place uh, to do a variety of things outside, um, whether it be in the city or up in the foothills. So it's, it's been really a wonderful experience on all levels. Great. Well, we, we wish you the best in your next chapter. Yeah. So I, I joke in, in a somewhat serious way that, uh, yeah, moving out to where the fires are in California and the drought is in California and where we're getting all the smoke from in California. So it'll be an interesting uh, transition over the next couple of months. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, we'll miss you, but, but um, know that our paths will, will continue to cross. I'd love to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about your path to where you are. So as you know, one of the, the things that we're hoping the Spur Campus can do is to introduce particularly young people, but to general public as well, to careers that they might not have known about or considered for themselves before. And we want to showcase how each person who comes to Spur can connect with the big challenges that we're facing in food, in water, and in health, regardless of what their background is, what their interests are, what lens they might be looking at those particular issues through. So can you tell us a little bit about your path to where you are? Were you one of those kids who was like, yes, I'm going to be a veterinarian from early days? Tell us how you got where you are. I'd say it's been a fairly non-traditional route. So um, as a kid, I did volunteer at a local vet hospital and I loved the veterinary aspect, but I wasn't um, sure that I wanted to do domestic animals as far as dogs and cats. I seem to have more of the pets that were, you know, ducks and lizards and guinea pigs than that. And I really um, was also intrigued by marine life and um, thinking about being a marine biologist. So when I was coming out of undergraduate, um, I was applying to both veterinary schools and to marine biology programs, um, graduate school. And um, when I got into veterinary school, I wanted to combine the two of them. So I really was interested in, you know, being a veterinarian for dolphins or working in marine biology and working with aquatic critters, uh, which I was able to do fairly well during veterinary school. So going to school in the middle of the cornfields of Illinois, we had nothing to do with aquatic but I would spend all of my summers going to places that did. So I spent uh, a summer out at um, Marine Land in, of the Pacific out in California, which um, doesn't exist anymore, but did uh, provide me great experience. When I was out there, I was up in Iceland. I was out in Woods Hole. I worked um, at various places and all of them were very helpful in deciding I would like to do some level of aquatics, but I probably didn't want to just work at an aquarium because um, as you can imagine, veterinarians who work at aquarium um, do wonderful things, but a lot of what they do is looking at the animal through the tank and trying different treatments versus I really am a very hands-on person. So I wanted to, you know, get my hands on the animal to do an exam or to do surgery or to get a blood sample. So I ended up doing kind of zoo and aquarium work together. And that's been a wonderful um, experience at many places. So I started at the Audubon Zoo in the Aquarium of the Americas in New Orleans, um, right out of veterinary school, and they were opening the aquarium right on the Mississippi and New Orleans and helped them open that and worked at the zoo at the same time. And then I went up and did a residency in New York City at the Bronx Zoo. Um, and they also were operating the Central Park Zoo and Flushing Meadow Zoo and um, down at, um, at Coney Island, the aquarium. So I got to work with beluga whales and gorillas and sharks and birds and a variety of different things which was a wonderful experience. And then they were opening the animal kingdom down in Orlando at Disney. And they called and said, Hey, we're trying to bring animal experts in from all over the country to open this brand new theme park. They were bringing in thousands and thousands of animals and hundreds of people. So that was an exciting time. And I ended up staying there for about 15 years as we opened the animal kingdom. And then um, also helped uh, oversee all the places that Disney had animals. So over at the living seas at Epcot, and um, all over the world. That's kind of the strange, weird career path. A lot of folks ask me about veterinary medicine and, and career ideas. And, I, and a couple of things I would say is it's been a wonderful ride. It's, it's terribly interesting to work with animals and very fulfilling to help them and help the people that are associated with them. But you do need to work hard both to get into college and then to do well in college to get into veterinary school. It's a very similar uh, path to anybody who's thinking about pre-med. And I actually have had conversations through the years about a lot of folks that have gone through the pre-med, pre-vet route and have applied to both medical schools and veterinary schools. And they're trying to decide where their passion lies um, because going into it is it's very similar as far as 
the courses that you that you may take. And then, of course, after you left Disney, you came to CSU. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what it's like to be the dean of the College of Vetmen Biomedical Sciences. What's sort of a day or a week in the life? Well, great question. I would say it's a mixture of a fair amount of administrative, not very exciting things often. So often students get to see me at commencement or um, times where I'm officially welcoming the new students or handing students their diplomas. But in general, um, much of our day is around um, meetings, which um, don't sound very exciting, but they are, as you know, Jocelyn, they're around meetings around new buildings. They're around meetings around how we're going to pay for certain things. And they're around meetings around um, just how we keep things operating uh, throughout throughout the day. Some of that is very exciting and fulfilling because we're building great things and, and doing things for students and for society. Sometimes that they can be, you know, banging your head against the wall because you feel like you've uh, done a bit of Groundhog's Day. But uh, I'll tell you, seeing some of the things come out of the ground and um, people enjoying them is very fulfilling and, and makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, I think that it's important to not uh, over-romanticize all of our jobs, right? There are meetings. That is real. At the same time, you know, the arc of the career in some ways is is you know, what we're, what we're looking at and the, and the results of all of those meetings are certainly worth it. You know, you, you were describing this career path and it not, it may be, it, it isn't traditional. I suppose there are not that many people in the world who are zoo vets or aquarium vets. Um, so it's, it's a bit of an uncommon path. It sounds completely fascinating. I mean, most people don't get to say, you know, you work with gorillas and belugas and in the course of a week. So, you know, there's a lot of things that might be surprising about the work that you have done over your career. What, what, what might people find surprising other than, you know, maybe what seems obviously surprising to me? (laughs) Um, We have a lot of students that are interested in that career route. And, And I would say it's a wonderful career route, but it's probably not as romantic or glorious as one might think. So let me give you an example. When we think about bringing our domestic animals, our dogs and cats, horses into the vet, um, those animals are awake. Many times they might be wagging their tail. Even if you have a cat that doesn't want to go to the vet, while it might be somewhat traumatic for the owner and the vet and the cat, it's, it's usually not um, a terrible experience. And um, when we think about zoo and wildlife medicine, rarely um, is anybody going to the vet willingly, right? So even in a situation where you might have a non-aggressive animal, those animals, if they're really wild, um, are not going to let, let you listen to their heart, are not going to let you um, get a blood sample or hold quietly for a uh, radiograph or an x-ray. So what people don't think about a lot is when you do zoo and wildlife medicine, typically those animals are anesthetized and um, you're trying to do as much as you can as far as blood samples and x-rays in a physical exam um, under anesthesia and then learn what you can about their health. And, and wake them up. So I think that's one area that people, maybe everybody's watched too many circuses where, you know, people are up close with the tigers or don't understand that um, when a vet's working with these animals in a wild situation, um, it's not like when you bring your dog and cat into the vet, these animals um, typically are sedated or anesthetized. Sometimes um, in a lot of the modern zoos now, these animals are trained or conditioned to help with their physical exam. So if we think about, for example, elephants who are extremely smart, we've known for years that we can use positive reinforcement to have them uh, help with their exams. So they often need a lot of footwork. So when I think about that, pedicures for, for elephants are quite common just because they can overgrow some of their nails. And so all the elephants that we think about that are in zoos actually are trained, they may get a carrot or a banana or something, um, and they will hold their feet up out in front of them um, through a bar so that nobody can get hurt. But through that, that um, somebody will sit there with a file or a very large um, nail um, trimmer that um, is basically giving them a pedicure while the animal is helping with their exam. And that can be true for an ultrasound to see if the animal is pregnant. That could be true for a variety of medical work that we do. And a lot of the other mammals also, for example, gorillas can um, help with their exam by holding their arm out and getting a blood sample. Um, So we've learned through the years now that it doesn't always have to be an anesthetic event for these animals. But I think people still have this perception that if you're a zoo vet, you're cuddling with baby tigers all day long 
and how how much fun could that be? I mean, what a great job. So thank you for, you know, that reality check. Um, and also for the mental image of elephant pedicures that, <laughs> you know, these conversations range widely. People's careers are so different and interesting. And, um, you know, you can go from meetings on one end of the spectrum to elephant pedicures on the other end. So um, one of the things that I'd like to talk a little bit about is um, the Spur Campus. Obviously, I love to talk about the Spur Campus, but in particular, what the college is anticipating doing down here as part of the Vita building, as you mentioned. You came from Animal Kingdom, where you set up the first on-show veterinary hospital, where people can come, visitors to Animal Kingdom can come and actually watch the veterinary team doing what you just described, working on the various animals that are there at Animal Kingdom, working with them, you know, procedures, exams, whatever needs to be done, and have taken that ethos and translated it to um, Spur. Can you say a little bit more about where the inspiration came for that original on-show piece at Animal Kingdom and why you continue to think it's a good idea to, to do it at Spur as well? You bet. Thanks, Jocelyn. So I, I'm constantly astounded by how intrigued um, the public is with veterinary medicine and with animal health and how we take care of critters. And what we found at the Animal Kingdom was um, that all ages... Um, all backgrounds really were intrigued by what we were doing. And it didn't matter if it was a, an exotic chicken or a gorilla that we were working on. People wanted to see it and they stayed for the entire procedure. Um, and, and what they came away with was a deep understanding of not only maybe that specific animal and that specific condition, but also of the, of the care of how deep um, the sciences and veterinary medicine and a better understanding of um, um, how people want to really help animals in that human animal bond. And so when we thought about what we could do at the Spur campus, obviously there are things we want to do to help the animals themselves and provide a service to people with pets and that might not be able to afford pets. And we wanted to work with phenomenal partners like the Dumb Friends League. Um, and we wanted to do um, more with teaching our veterinary students down in Denver. So how could we have a place that does all that? But in addition, um, what a great opportunity to help educate the public about how wonderful science is, about how wonderful um, careers in animal health are, and how we do things that are really um, helping animals and to reinforce that human-animal bond. So, So that's kind of how we took the idea of, yes, a hospital is going to be transformational. Yes, we want to help this group and teach our students. But how could we take that to the next level of um, bringing in school groups, bringing in families, opening the hospital up in big, wonderful ways so you could see everything from how to do a dental exam on a, on a dog to what happens if your horse is lame and, and be able to ask people who are experts about these and, and really spend as much time as you'd like learning about um, health and sometimes it's animal, but sometimes it's also translates into human health and how we can better um, deal with health in our families and in our world too. You hit on this, but April Steele, who is the executive director of the Dumb Friends League, has been a guest on the podcast and described in a bit more detail what Dumb Friends League does. And uh, just to remind our listeners that Dumb Friends League at Spur will be operating a clinic that serves qualified families, low-income families, um, so that they can afford to bring their animals in for veterinary care. And at the same time, we'll be teaching our veterinary students who are there on rotation, so they're there for two weeks at a time, working with those veterinarians, understanding how um, to be a, a clinic vet in that context. And then sort of the icing on all of that is this fact that it is on show, that one wall of the entire hospital is glass, that the veterinarians and the technicians will have microphones that will allow them to interact with the general public on the other side of that glass. So an amazing opportunity and certainly stealing from your Animal Kingdom playbook on that one. And we're really excited. We opened so soon and, and are excited to see how um, the general public, to your point, they, they stay and watch procedures at a, at a zoo veterinary clinic from start to finish. And, and um, we think that will happen for us as well. 
another uh, question related to the Spur campus around diversity. So you know that the Spur campus also is interested in um, all of this outreach and this bringing, you know, bringing families in, bringing K-12 field trips in. A, a lot of what we're hoping to do um, is to interest more diverse students in careers in science and technology and health. Um, can you talk a little bit about diversity in um, veterinary medicine and, and the fields that you've been in now and some of the challenges and what you hope that the Spur Campus and other similar programs do. Thanks, Jocelyn. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm sad to report that the veterinary profession, I think, is um, the whitest profession out there. And we have a lot of work to do in all of the different forms when we think about diversity, um, cultural, racial, a long list of things there that, that we need to work on to help improve diversity in the veterinary workspace. Um, and I think things like the Spur Campus and getting kids in at an early age and showing them how interesting science and how interesting health is, getting them excited about going to college is really a big, big part of that. So um, it takes a variety of things, everything from you know looking at outreach programs, scholarship programs, new pipelines and, and funnel programs to get more and more people into the sciences and into health in general. But this is one area that we're really excited about because of the general public's interest. And because I think, as we said before about virtual reality, if we can make um, learning fun and applicable to our lives, which I think is exactly what SPUR is all about, um, we'll get a lot of people from all different walks of life that um, are interested and learning more about it and hopefully having careers in that space. That is, that's our hope uh, as well and a, a function that we hope the Spur Campus can provide um, just a space to house that intersection of various different people with various backgrounds with careers they may not have even been thinking about, whether it's actually being a veterinarian or being a, a technician or one of the other careers within that that broader health spectrum, veterinary health or or human health. So um, we are almost out of time. So we're going to um, just wrap up here and I'll um, ask you to let us know how people can find the college, how people can find you on social media if they want to follow what you're up to um, and how they can get more information about the college in general. Sure. So um, please check out at, at Colorado State University. Um, they've got sections for all of our eight colleges, but our college, the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, has a phenomenal website. And if you're interested in bringing your animal into our veterinary teaching hospital and all the different specialties, you can find information there. If you're interested in um, coming here and getting a bachelor's degree in biomedical sciences and running off to med school or something fun like that, um, lots of information about how to apply. If you're interested in veterinary medicine, if you're interested in the research that we do, um, there's a ton of great information and I'd encourage you to check out our, our website. Um, and we're also a great place to visit. Uh, I'll put a plug in, you know, once we open at Spur, that's going to be, you know, innovative and new and um, wonderful place to spend some time. And uh, we obviously have a beautiful campus up in Fort Collins. Come by anytime. Great. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Stetter. Our last question, our Spur of the Moment question for you. I'm sitting down. Okay. You are. So this question is, is a tough one for some people to answer but I'm going to ask it anyway. If And I'm going to make it a little easier by giving you three. So if you had three albums that you got to take with you to a deserted island. Oh, really? Three albums. Um, so a fairly big U2 fan. So I probably have to pick maybe Greatest Hits or one of their sure. U2 albums. In the day, I was a big Elton John dude. So I think I might have to pick, you know, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road or something along the... Uh, uh, along those lines. Um, and then I would probably have to flip a coin for, you know, a long list of uh, others in that uh, oldies genre. I think I uh, just actually heard the, the band Chicago a couple of weeks ago at Dumb Friends League uh, events. Um, so I love the old Chicago band, but there's Doobie Brothers and there's a long list of other folks that I'd probably have to put on the list. <laughs> The Spur of the Moment podcast is produced by Peach Islander Productions, and our theme music is by Ketza. Please visit the show notes for links mentioned during today's episode. We hope you'll join us in two weeks for the next Spur of the Moment episode. Until then, be well. Be well.